Greet everyone the best greeting. Assalamu alaikum. This means peace and blessings be upon you. Uh, thank you everyone for coming today. Uh, this is the first day, first day talk on uh, for the Islamic Awareness Week. Uh, we named this uh, theme of the whole week is Islamic Focus. And uh, you all know that we have an uh, interfaith center in the University of Surrey. So the first day talk is basically for that purpose, interfaith talk. We'll have, uh, we have a guest, Reverend Richard Cook. Uh, 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 thank you for coming here today. Uh, we'll have uh, Dr. Hosni as a moderator this evening. Uh, in between, and uh, we will have an introduction. First, uh, first, we will do the Quran recitation, the English translation. We will ask for the early response. <laughs> إنما يتذكر أولو الألباب الذين يوفون بعهد الله ولا ينقضون الميثاق والذين يصلون ما أمر الله به أن يوصل والذين يصلون ما أمر الله به أن يوصل ويخشون ربهم ويخافون سوء الحساب والذين صبروا ابتغاء وجه ربهم وأقاموا الصلاة وأنفقوا مما رزقناهم سرا وعلانية وأنفقوا مما رزقناهم سرا وعلانية ويدرؤون بالحسنة السيئة أولئك لهم عقبى الملائكة يدخلون عليهم من كل باب سلام عليكم بما صبرتم فنعم عقب الدار والذين ينقضون عهد الله من بعد ميثاقه ويقطعون ما أمر الله به أن يوصل ويقطعون ما أمر الله به أن يوصل ويفسدون في الأرض أولئك لهم اللعنة ولهم سوء الله يبسط الرزق لمن يشاء ويقدر وفرحوا بالحياة الدنيا وما الحياة الدنيا في الآخرة إلا متاع ويقول الذين كفروا لولا عليه آية من ربه قل إن الله يضل من يشاء ويهدي إليه من أناب الذين آمنوا وتطمئن الذين 
آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات طوبى لهم وحسن مآب بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن المتقين في جنات وعيون آخذين ما آتاه ربهم إنهم كانوا قبل ذلك محسنين كانوا قليلا من الليل ما يهجعون وبالأسحار هم يستغفرون وفي أموالهم حق للسائل والمحوم وفي الأرض آيات للموقنين وفي أنفسكم أفلا تبصرون وفي السماء السماء والأرض إنه لحق مثل ما أنكم تنطقون صدق الله العظيم صدق الله العظيم وبلغ رسوله الكريم ونحن على ما قال ربنا وخالقنا ورازقنا من الشهدين ولما أوجب وألزم غير جاحدين والحمد لله رب العالمين. In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful, and uh, <coughs> the Stifar that there is no good worship to worship but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Muhammad, his messenger. Uh, we're going to go uh, very briefly through the English translation of the, of the verses that I've just recited. And as you probably know, um, you cannot you know, translate the Quran verses literally word by word, but the meaning of it can be translated. So I'll let uh, uh, I've been uh, just trying to follow uh, the recitation we started. So, shall he then, who knows that what has been revealed unto you uh, from your Lord it is the truth I'd be like him um, so small and my eyes are so old <laughs> there's a bigger one yeah, I've got such a small one <laughs> is then he who knows that what has been revealed to you, O Muhammad, from your Lord is the truth, as like him who is blind? But it is only the men of understanding that pay heed. Those who fulfill the covenant of Allah and break not the mithak, a bond, treaty, or covenant. And those who join that which Allah has commanded to be joined, and fear the Lord, and dread the terrible reckoning, and those who remain patient, seeking their Lord's countenance, perform salat, and spend out of that which we have bestowed on them secretly and openly, and repel evil with good, and such there is, for such there is a good end. Paradise, the everlasting gardens, which they shall enter, and those who acted righteously from among their fathers and their wives and their offspring, and angels shall enter to them from every gate, saying, Salam Alaikum, for you persevered in patience. Excellent in, indeed is their final home. But then there's the other side. Those who break the covenant of Allah after its ratification and sever that which Allah has commanded to be joined and work mischief in the land, on them is the curse, and for them is the unhappy. <coughs> Allah increases the provision for whom he wills, and straightens uh, for whom he wills. And they rejoice in the life of the world, whereas the life of this world is compared with the hereafter is but a brief passing enjoyment. And those who disbelieve say, 
Why is not a sign sent down to him from his Lord? In other words, why didn't Muhammad do miracles? Say, verily Allah sends astray whom he wills and guides to himself those who turn to him in repentance. Those who believed and whose hearts find rest in the remembrance of Allah, verily in the remembrance of Allah do hearts find rest. Those who believed and work righteousness, tuba, all kinds of happiness or names of a tree in paradise, is for them a beautiful place of final return. Thus we have sent you, O Muhammad, to a community before whom other communities have passed away. All right? I've got to hear that. All right. I finished it. <laughs> 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 the opportunity to read it in a bigger book, the same translation, though. Yeah. Hello, <coughs> uh, Thank you very much for the narration uh, of the translation. Uh, now, uh, for, to introduce the Reverend Richard Cook, I will invite our uh, chaplain of uh, Christian, uh, Jonathan Frost. Uh, he will introduce uh, Reverend Richard. In the meantime, uh, the, uh, after uh, introduction, Reverend uh, will speak for 20 25 minutes, and then we'll have our moderator, uh, Khatib for the university and the community, Sheikh uh, Hosni Hamuda. He will be here and then we'll wait for uh, Abdul Green to be in time. Uh, it's very good to be with you all. And I don't need to welcome you. This is home and our place. Jonathan Frost, if some of you have not met me before, I'm coordinating chaplain here of our wonderful chaplaincy, which brings together different faiths into dialogue and friendship, and to put our faith in focus. I welcome this week, I'm delighted that the Islamic uh, Society's committee has worked so hard on the event, uh, and we look forward to the week, and we look forward to listening carefully and respectfully to one another. A word of introduction to my friend on the left. Richard is vicar of St Andrew's Goldsworth Park in Woking, and I know that some of you have met him before. He is a good Christian man, and someone I trust as a friend and brother, and someone I listen to and have learned from. He's been involved for many years in building relationships between the faith communities that make up this community in the UK. He's been involved in Across, a project in Woking, and Woking People of Faith, which I know many of you have come across their work in the town of Woking. Uh, some of you will have been to the light box, to exhibitions put on there. But I'm aware that Richard is uh, a friend of all faiths and committed to the path of Jesus the Christ as a Christian. And so I commend to you my brother and friend and what he has to say to you, which I know will come with love, with respect and from integrity of heart. Richard Cook. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for your welcome, and uh, thank you for your invitation, and uh, I'm very glad to be here. I've been here before, usually sitting in the ranks and doing nothing, because uh, the Church of England, which is a very funny organisation which I uh, work for and Jonathan works for, we sometimes have our meetings here. Um, let me tell you a little bit about myself. The theme tonight is faith and unity. I was born in China. My father was a banker. Um, in, in the Far East, as uh, he would have called it, um, and he worked in China and Japan um, before I was born, uh, helping the struggling Japanese economy and then the struggling Chinese economy to get going. Seems like he did a good job, um, because they've done quite well. And then, after that, we lived in Hong Kong and then in India, and the struggling Indian economy is doing pretty well, okay. So, my dad and his generation clearly did a good job. Um, I was at school in India, 
um, three or four different schools. Um, and then I came to school in this country, and I then went to university in Oxford and did a chemistry degree where I did very little work, but I did manage to get a teaching job after that. Um, and I taught chemistry for three years. And then I trained to uh, become a, a minister in the Church of England, and I got another, another degree, this time in theology, also from Oxford. It was a better quality of degree than the one I got for chemistry, but I didn't play so much football in those days. So. Um, my second job, after I was ordained in the Church of England, was in a northern town called Bolton. Uh, sadly, they lost their football game um, over the weekend, but uh, there is still hope that they will stay up and Hull will go down, but um, this is what we pray for. Um, but where I worked in Bolton, there were a lot of people from Gujarat in northwest India, and also a lot of people from Pakistan. And uh, it was a wake-up call to me, having lived, as it were, over there, to discover that over there, had come over here. And uh, that was quite fascinating, really. Um, and I, I loved making friends with uh, Muslim people, particularly um, in Bolton. Um, I used to take groups of Christian people to the, the mosque just above where our church was. Uh, it was in a rundown Methodist church in those days, Zakaria Mosque on um, Cannon Street in Bolton. But now it's a spanking great big mosque, and uh, they've done a brilliant job of raising the money themselves. They didn't get any money from anywhere else. They raised it all themselves to build this great mosque. Um, having been there for some time, I moved to um, Woking, which, as you may know, is the place where the first purpose-built mosque in the UK was put up in uh, 1889. And um, I've spoken at... Shah Jahan Mosque several times, and uh, at the Shia Mosque, I've also visited um, the Walton Road Mosque, although they've moved off Walton Road now onto Marlborough Road. Um, I've also spoken at um, the uh, mosque in Hounslow, and um, for fun, no actually I wanted to do it, I did a research project in Islam, uh, in particular into the Sufi practices of many British Muslims. So, um, I know quite a lot about uh, Rumi and uh, loads of the Punjabi Sufi um, poets, and uh, I would uh, happily talk at a great length about that, but there we are. Um, but I am, as Jonathan said, Vicar of Goldsworth Park, which is uh, a, a modern housing area in Woking. If I tell you about the church where I minister, yesterday, I was trying to think, now, the theme is faith and unity. Yesterday, Sunday, we were worshipping, and I was looking out at our congregation, and um, they were mostly white English, but then we had uh, people from Zimbabwe, Nigeria, Uganda, Japan, Germany, Holland, Wales, Scotland, <laughs> South Africa, um, quite a mixed bunch, really. Um, young and old, black and white, rich and poor, uh, multiracial, multi-generational, and yet seeking to be one, because we believe that God is one, and that he's called his people to be one. Um, and uh, our story goes back to when, as we read in the, uh, what we call the Christian Old Testament, the Jewish scriptures, about the call of God to Abraham. And I know that uh, Abraham is obviously sacred to Muslims as well. But the Lord said to Abram, Leave your country and your people and your father's household and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And this is the bit that is particularly precious to people like me. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So that in the call of God, the one true God, to Abram, who was, we would say, an Iraqi, built, uh, born down on um, the Gulf of Basra, um, called to go to a new place, not just for his own benefit, 
but so that God, the one true God, could bless all nations. But the way that uh, God had promised was that people would all be blessed in and through Abram. As you know, in, certainly in the Bible and then also in the Quran, there's the story when Abram is called to offer up his son as a sacrifice. He never quite gets to kill the lad, because at the last minute, the angel comes and says, Abram, don't do that, don't do that. And he looks and he look, finds over in a bush, there is a ram caught by its horns in the bush. And instead of the sun, Abram offers up this sacrifice, which in the Quran is described as the very great sacrifice. Great story. Very precious to Christians, Muslims and Jews. Now obviously the Christian understanding is that God brought the promise to Abram to fulfilment in and through the person and the work of Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ. <coughs> and that God has brought the blessings that he wants to have for all humanity to all people in and through Jesus. Jesus said a remarkable thing once, he's, well he said many remarkable things, but one thing he said was, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Now, a peacemaker, ah, oh, hallelujah, oh, <laughs> he's arrived, great. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Now, this, these are words from Jesus. And um, he is assuming that human beings find it easier to be enemies than to be friends. <coughs> there are many, many things that we can argue about, we can fight about, that we can disagree about. But in our troubled world, we need to be peacemakers. So that the blessings of God can be shared amongst us. When I speak at a mosque, I very often say to uh, the brothers, and there's sometimes sisters there as well, I very often say to them, now I'm so pleased to be here, and I know that all of you want me to become a Muslim, and everybody nods their head. <laughs> and then I say, well, I'm a Christian, and I want all of you, I would love it if all of you would become Christians, and they all met their head. Yeah, well, fair enough, fair enough. In other words, we're both of us missionary faiths. And yet, we don't have to be at war because we're missionary faiths. So I spend a lot of time, as Jonathan says, trying to help Christians understand Islam and Muslims to un understand Christianity better. So that instead of being slightly scared of each other, fearful, nervous, what's he going to say? Am I going to agree? Is he going to say things that uh, I think are rubbish? Or whatever. Probably you won't agree with what I say. But actually... In the purposes of God, Jesus has called me to be a peacemaker so that I can be what's described as a child of God. <coughs> One of the great stories in the um, Muslim tradition, you'll know it, is uh, the story of Muhammad's uh, night's journey, his ascent to heaven, and um, obviously referred to in, uh, briefly in Surah 53, verse 9, where he talks about... Um, it's a great... Oh, I marked it in the Quran. Thank you. Um, let me read you the, the, the start of this Surah, where 
Uh, it describes the journey. I'll have to read it in English, the English translation, or else, because my Arabic isn't very good yet. I need to go back to Arabic class. <laughs> By the star, when it goes down, uh, your companion has neither gone astray nor has erred. Nor does he speak of his own desire. It is only a revelation revealed. He has been taught by one mighty in power, the angel Gabriel, one free from any defect in body and mind, that he rose and became stable. When he, Gabriel, was in the highest part of the horizon, then he approached and came close. Well, this is interpretation in this uh, translation, because really the Hadith says that it's Muhammad who gets taken up, stepwise up, 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 up through the heavens, that's right. Uh, and he finally arrives, and he gets to the seventh heaven, and there he meets Moses. Um, and uh, it describes in this verse how he was at a distance of two bows length from the very throne of God. What an amazing privilege to be so close to God. Um, when I visited Pakistan, I went, was uh, with um, one of, a big Sufi speaker, and he had a crowd of 5,000 in front of him, and he spoke for about 48 minutes on uh, uh, describing this event to the crowd. But just before he spoke, he said to me, with about three minutes warning, would I like to speak to the 5,000 people gathered? Uh, I said, well, all right, I suppose so, thank you very much. Um, Unfortunately, I was introduced as Bishop Cook of London. Well, I'm not the Bishop of London, and I hope the Bishop of London didn't find out. <laughs> but there's a similar story, but different, in the Bible, of when the Apostle St. John also has a vision of heaven. And this is what he sees. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people and language standing before the throne of God and in front of the Lamb. The Lamb is code there for uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. They were wearing white robes and they were holding palm branches in their hands and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on, to the, on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing round the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell down on their faces before the throne and they worshipped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honour and power and strength be to our God for ever and ever. And I suppose uh, what I want to say is that the message of the Bible is that we can only be one as human beings if we are one with God. If we are thoroughly and completely devoted to Him, then there can be unity. And uh, we pray for that, that God would bring us peace and unity as we worship Him, as He alone deserves to be worshipped. Everything else will cause us to divide. But if we worship God, we can be one. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Now I will invite uh, our Muslim chaplain, Abdul Mati, to introduce uh, Sheikh uh, Abdurrahim Green. And then we'll... Uh, um, as Hamza says, I'm your Muslim chaplain, for those of you who don't know me. Um, and I work very closely with Jonathan in the Interfaith team. And I also know Richard through the Christian Muslim Forum. Um, we meet in Surrey from time to time. And it's kind of interesting, I'm, I'm just thinking about connections between all of us. My dad is an Anglican priest. So uh, thinking about unity of faith. Uh, there, there are a lot of parallels and relationships that are beneath the surfaces and, and the rest of it. And also I realise both Abdul Rahman Green and Richard Cook, they both have banker fathers. <laughs> 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 so, 
Because uh, uh, Abdul Rahman Green was born in Tanzania and then spent uh, his summers as he was growing up in um, Cairo. Uh, his dad was out there helping their economies. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we're very lucky to have, uh, very blessed to have Abdul Rahman Green uh, speaking to us on uh, unity and faith from the perspective of uh, the Muslim. Um, and he, um, his journey to Islam goes back. He's like, like me, he's uh, um, accepted Islam not because of uh, it was in our culture, but we made decisions to become Muslims. Um, and um, his decision to take up the faith of Islam goes back to 1987, when he started questioning um, what he was doing on this. I mean, I hope they're not speaking for you like this. We've never met before. But, uh, <laughs> um, and since then, he's worked for many years at the London, the London Central Mosque, coordinating visits and outreach and the um, English speaking side of things there. Um, and he's in great demand. I'm very uh, lucky to have him, as I said, and I'd like to welcome him to the Rostrum. Uh, I'd like to Um, we begin by praising Allah, we praise Him, we seek His help and we ask for His forgiveness. And we take refuge with Allah from the evil of ourselves and from the evil consequence of our evil actions. Whomsoever God guides, no one can misguide, but whomsoever God leaves to go astray, no one can guide. And I testify that God alone is worthy of worship and that Muhammad is his servant and his messenger. Um, I, I am not in any way, shape or form a fan of personally participating in debates. Um, I, debates have their place. Uh, however, debates to me uh, are a little bit like boxing matches. Uh, you know, and usually when debates take place, you know, you have the Christian in the right hand, or maybe on the left hand, you know, whatever, and you have the Muslim in the other corner, and it's like, okay, ready, set, go, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, uh, and I, 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 I know Muslims often take a, almost a delight uh, in, in vigorous speakers, uh, battering Christians with uh, various things, uh, and, and um, you know, uh, but I, I really personally don't like participating uh, in, in that type of... So if, if anyone came here today hoping that I was going to give Richard a good battering, it's not going to happen. Um, I came here within the spirit of what I, what, what I understand as a dialogue. And I believe a dialogue has a different set of etiquettes and manners from a debate. Uh, I don't mind dialogues. I think they're constructive. Debates... Um, usually only serve to entrench people in their own respective positions. Um, so what I want to talk about under this topic today of uh, faith and unity um, is um, something that I believe is common <coughs> to our faiths. Something that I believe is common to Christianity and to Islam. Uh, and I think it's ground upon which Muslims and Christians can and should work together. Uh, and I believe it has its uh, it has its precedent in the Quran and in the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad. May God's peace and blessings be upon him. Uh, and so I'd like to I'd like to begin by justifying my position. Uh, from the texts, or from, I suppose we could say, from the life example of the Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him. So most of us who are Muslim will be familiar with uh, the reference in the Qur'an to Ahlul Kitab. The term Ahlul Kitab means the people of the book. Uh, and the people of the book, uh, usually, most scholars agree, it, it, it's referring to Jews and to Christians. Actually, it's interesting that uh, through a process of analogy, uh, many Muslim scholars also said that the, the, the status of the Ahlul Kitab applies to 
any religious tradition that has a book. Now, I tend to be a person who, for better or for worse, thinks about things quite deeply. Uh, I'm not one of those people who is always really content just to uh, accept something and that's the way it is. I want to understand why. And I've thought a lot about why did Allah give the Ahlul Kitab a status that he didn't give to anybody else. Now I don't hold the position, and I don't agree, uh, that Christians and Jews uh, are the, the, that they have the same faith as us. I do believe that Judaism uh, is essentially monotheistic, and I believe that Christianity uh, is a, a sort of, I don't want to really go into it, but it's a sort of uh, mixture of monotheism. Of course, as Muslims, we, we can't accept that it is purely monotheistic, since Christians generally believe that Jesus is God. And that fundamentally contradicts everything a Muslim believes about God. And, and here is my point. Uh, shirk is considered to be, or making partners, or making rivals with God, is considered to be, in the Qur'an, through the teachings of the Prophet, the serious most, uh, the most serious crime a human being can ever commit in the sight of God. And therefore to claim that Jesus is God, or to claim in any literal sense that people are the sons of God, and maybe in a symbolic sense there's room, but in a literal sense that someone might be the son of God, then that would be considered to be, it is considered to be shirk. So why then? This is my question. Why has the Qur'an afforded a very special status to the people of the book, to the Jews and the Christians? Well, specifically in this case, perhaps to the Christians, since from our perspective, clearly from a Qur'anic perspective, this belief contains something which is so serious, which is, which is shirk. And I think the secret here comes to understanding something about faith, about what God wants from human beings, uh, and that ultimately human beings have to make a choice themselves about which path they follow uh, and which belief they hold onto. Uh, and there is that famous statement in the Quran, La ikrah fadeen, there is no compulsion in religion. Truth stands out clear from error. But, as I would really, and what I believe is important uh, to point out, and perhaps controversial today, is that religion, that Islam, rather like Judaism, is not just religion. It is not just religion. Islam is religion and law. It is religion and law. And it's very similar to Judaism in this sense, traditional uh, Judaism. It, it is not only how do we pray to God, how do we fast, how do we give charity, what are the noble characteristics, the noble character that a human being should try to adopt, but it is also law. The Qur'an defines the laws through which and by which human beings should live. And this is the very important component, that component of law. And it is very interesting that although perhaps today one looks to the West and thinks of the West as being a land where religious tolerance is practiced, uh, in spite of Richard's seniority to me in age, not much, but maybe a little bit, you know. Uh, <laughs> um, and certainly, uh, in terms of uh, Christianity has been around longer than Islam. But I would say that Islam has seniority on the level of practicing tolerance amongst faiths. I think historically, uh, the idea of tolerating other faiths uh, is quite a new one in the Christian world, uh, especially in the Western Christian world. Uh, and uh, certainly within British and French and German society, well, it wasn't until very recently that Christians were pretty intolerant of each other. In fact, if you look to the causes of why secularism is so strong in France, it comes back to the religious wars between Protestants and Catholics. 
Um, so this idea of religious tolerance, of course, however, is something that is enshrined in the Qur'an and in the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, especially in regard to the Ahlul Kitab. So it comes back to why. I'm thinking, why is that? Now, there are, without doubt, huge similarities between uh, Islam and Christianity and Judaism. We all of us have a fundamentally, I would say, a fundamentally monotheistic idea. If you were to ask any Jew or Christian or Muslim to rationally explain the existence of God, the arguments that we bring forward are mostly the same ones. Uh, Jews, Christians and Muslims also believe in angels, they believe that God has sent prophets, that God has sent to those prophets books and messengers. We believe that there is a life after death, a day of judgment, an eternal reward, paradise, an eternal punishment, hellfire. Uh, so there are many, many things that we share in common. Also Muslim Jews and Christians believe uh, in different degrees, but in, in the concept of free will, that human beings uh, have been given the freedom to choose to believe and worship God or not. So these are very common things. But I'm not sure that those alone are the reasons. In fact, I don't think they are the main reasons. The main reason, I believe, is to do with morality. The main reasons, I believe, are to do with morality. That someone's computer. Very devout computer. Program <laughs> team. <laughs> yeah, the, the main reasons I believe are to do with morality. And and this is where this is an area which I believe people of faith. And I do believe, particularly, Muslim Jews and Christians have, uh, there is an area where not only should we cooperate, but I do believe we have to. Now I'm going to uh, introduce a, to a topic that I believe is really very hugely important. Uh, and perhaps it's going to sound really controversial as I introduce it. If we don't have a transcendental anchor for our morality, in reality, we have no morality. Or at least we could say accurately, there is no such thing as objective morality. This is something very, very important. Because, to, to translate that simply, if we don't believe in God, and if we don't believe that God has revealed to us guidance through which and by which we should live, that God has defined for us what is right and what is wrong and what is good and what is evil, then you have no objective viewpoint of what good and evil and right and wrong is. So the point is therefore that if one does not believe in God, if one is an atheist presumably, if you don't believe in God you're an atheist, right? The challenge here is if you are an atheist, or if a society is a secular society, my question here is, what is the basis of their morality? What is the basis on which they make the decision, this is right and this is wrong and this is good and this is evil and we should do this and we shouldn't do that? Well, according to the theory of evolution, we are just animals maybe slightly sophisticated animals, but we're just animals. That's all we are. We're just a product like every other creature, just like the ants and the worms and the elephants and the trees and whatever. We're just a product of random mutation of DNA that has been chosen through natural selection. And therefore, we just do whatever it is that nature has decided or programmed for us to do. To give you an example in respect to animals, it's very obvious. When you see a lion attack a little gazelle and rip its throat open, you don't go, oh, what a wicked lion. That's just the lion doing what the lion does. When the male shark 
forces itself upon the female shark in order to copulate, yeah, if a, a, a man did that to a woman, we'd call it rape. And it would be considered to be a crime. However, that's just a shark doing what sharks do. Because they're animals. They just do what animals do. So therefore, in reality, if we are just animals, and we are just products of evolution and random mutation of DNA, morality, in reality, is an artificial construct. You can't really talk about human beings doing bad things when one group of human beings commits genocide on another, and we rape and we steal, and, and similarly, when we love and we do so-called altruistic acts, in fact, really, these are just products of our evolution. We're just behaving how we have evolved to behave. That's what you have to believe. And if there is something we call morality, it's only a convenience for us. It's only something that is a construct that we use in order to survive and procreate and advance ourselves as a species. But that morality, of course, is always subject to change. It's always subject to change. Because as society changes, morality changes. So let me give you a thought experiment, therefore. If this is what society is going to believe and is going to teach, then in reality, how do you argue that genocide is actually really bad? How? I mean, hands up who thinks killing 6 million Jews is absolutely evil, it's objectively wrong, and it could never be right. Right? I mean, most of us, we agree with that, right? Not all of us, I notice. Uh, most of us, okay? Some people just don't want to put their hands up, okay? But I mean, most of us agree that that's an objectively wrong. But imagine if the Nazis took over the whole of the world. They planned that. And so, therefore, the de facto government of the planet was fascism. And they, you know, put all their propaganda machinery to convince everybody that eliminating Jews was really a hugely important thing. And we all accepted it, because that's just the social norm. The reality is that although a lot of people would say, yes, it's wrong. In reality, a lot of those very self-same people would be participating in it, I am sure. Unless, of course, you have a transcendental anchor. Unless your morality is not something that is subject to the whims of society. That you have an idea of right and wrong that is outside yourself and outside ourselves as human beings. And that is where I believe Jews and Muslims and Christians have a very, very important <coughs> common ground. And I think you find the Pope has spoken about it. I don't, we don't, Muslims don't have a representative to speak on that same level, but I certainly know it's an issue that Muslims are discussing a lot. This whole idea that morality is something that is transient, transient, that can change from minute to minute, hour to hour, day to day, whatever society happens to decide is moral and acceptable, well, you know, we should go with the flow. The church should just get real and move with the times. And I remember, you know, back in the 1970s, I, I don't know about, you know, it was, it was very strange to see that, the, I mean, people were hemorrhaging from the church. Uh, hemorrhaging. People were just, you know, churches were empty. So they were so desperate to get people to come to the church, they started having discos in the church. Most of the days of John Travolta and disco and all that type of stuff. And I even remember feeling very, unco very uncomfortable with that, I mean, although I was a, a very uh, um, fond of disco dancing. Well, I don't do it anymore. I was a very good dancer as well. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, no, I, you can take it from my dad. My dad said, you know, it's, it's such a shame, Anthony. He does dancing. He was such a wonderful dancer. He used to say. <laughs> but, you know, and, um, but I, I used to find it, you know, really strange that, why? Why would you do that? You know, why would you do that? Because at the end of the day, you know, you don't, you don't want to lower, I'm sorry, and that's what it, I mean it, you don't want to lower yourself to that level. You know, people of faith have to stand for their principles. Because their principles are not the ones they have invented themselves. We didn't write the Ten Commandments. We didn't write the Quran. We didn't write the Beatitudes. Those are things that have come from God. That is guidance that has come from the Creator. So the meek are always blessed, and the peacemakers are always blessed, right? Even if you are a gangster in the street and you want respect, right? Yeah, and you have to shoot someone to get it. No, blessed are the meek, right? And that the things that God has made unlawful, no one has the right to make them lawful. This is an affront to God. It is, it is as if we are saying, we know better than, yes, God, you know, whatever, yes, but you know, you said that a long time ago. Right? Well, do we know better than God? Is that, but this is, you see, in Islam, this is considered, to, this is shirk. That a person can claim that they could legislate in opposition to what God has legislated. That they can make lawful what God has made unlawful. <coughs> and they can make unlawful what God has made lawful. Actually, <coughs> this is something the Quran chastised the Jews and the Christians for. In the Quran, Allah said that the Jews and Christians took their priests and their rabbis as gods besides Allah. And there was one companion who used to be a Christian. He said, oh, messenger of God, we didn't used to worship them. Now, he, he was thinking in his mind, we didn't used to prostrate before them and, you know, take them as a direction of prayer and we didn't used to pray to them. We didn't use, he had this idea. And the Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, said, didn't they make lawful for you what God had made unlawful and you accepted it? And didn't they make unlawful for you what God had made lawful and you accepted it? He said, yes, we did that. He said, that was your worship of them. And of course, I would say that Muslims are doing exactly the same things today. These things are not in the Quran. The stories of the Quran about the people who came before us are not there so we can call people bad names. No. They're there so we should learn the lesson and we shouldn't fall into the same mistakes that people made before us. Although it is almost inevitable that we will do that. But this is what I go back to about unity and faith. I believe that Muslims, Jews and Christians especially, especially, but actually you'll find most religions generally, but Muslims, Jews and Christians especially, share a very, very common <coughs> idea of moral values. Our moral values are very, very similar. Yes, it may be that in Islam we have more an, of, of, of an emphasis on certain things. And Judaism may have, you know, Islam may be more of an emphasis on, you know, ritual and prayer and, and being precise in that. Okay? Similarly, I suppose Judaism, Christianity has more of an emphasis on love and compassion and mercy, although it is certainly not absent from Islam. Of course, every single chapter of the Quran, except one, begins with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of God, the most merciful, the mercy giving. Mercy is certainly an, an important part and component of our religion. However, it's this issue of morality. And actually, I believe in, in an increasingly secularized and secularizing society. The relevance 
of the morals and the values that are the morals and values that have been revealed by the Creator for the benefit, for the benefit of humanity. Because God does not need us to worship Him. God does not need us to follow His laws. God does not need us to follow His guidance because God is self-sufficient. He is free of all wants and needs. No, this guidance has been given to us from God's knowledge, from His wisdom. He created us. He knows us better than we know ourselves. And it is His mercy that He has guided us according to this knowledge. And this is the common ground. And, and this is also, this is the strongest common ground. And this is also interesting that I go back to my former point. Why in Islamic law, in the Islamic law, Jews and Christians almost have a completely independent judiciary system in an Islamic uh, lands that are governed according to Islamic law. Churches judge their people by their ecclesiastical law. And there are some general laws that apply to all people, but basically, churches, rabbis, synagogues, they judge, they have full access to implement their own laws on their own people. In fact, they are obliged to do that. In fact, someone was telling me, and I've never actually heard this before, that Umar ibn al-Khattab, who was the uh, third, uh, sorry, the second ruler of the Muslims, he actually appointed someone to go and check that the Christians and Jews were applying their laws properly upon their people. <coughs> it's part of his... Uh, and it's interesting, of course, when uh, we're often reminded how uh, we live in a very tolerant society. Uh, and that aren't we so lucky to be able to live in England and practice our faith? But, of course, from the point of view of Muslims, in our history, Jews and Christians have generally been much more free to practice their faith in a much more complete sense than Muslims are. I mean, look at what, ha what happened to the, ha the... Look at the furore that came when the Archbishop of Canterbury, you know, said it was inevitable that some, as some, some aspects of Sharia law were going to have to be included in, 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 you know, in British law. And what an uproar there was about that, just the sheer notion of it from a so-called tolerant society. And I, of course I don't dismiss that. It is tolerant to a degree. But that's not my... Well, I suppose it is my beef. I have a beef with secularism. I don't agree with secularism. I think secularism is very dangerous. Its ultimate path is a self-destructive path. Because a society without morals, a society without objective moral values, inevitably, inevitably must ultimately go down the path, and this is what I will, you will find inevitably happens, of just merely following desires. Whatever the majority of people feel like doing and what they desire is what they are going to push forward. 